You're listening to Steve Ludwig's Classic Pop Culture. Tonight's guests, Joe Russo, Shelley Harris, a.k.a. Angry Black, and Tommy Marr. And now, your sponsors. ABC Movers and Shakers. Check out abcmoversandshakers.com for all your moving needs. And... A&S Comics. Check out ASComics.com. Now shipping your comics and animation worldwide. And now your host, Steve Ludwig. Well, thank you very much, beloved Rick Hendrickson. How you doing tonight, Rick? Uh, I'm very good, and I do apologize. There's a little bit of background noise in here because it's muggy. Oh. I, I have to have air conditioning on 62 degrees in the studio, or I'm kind of a diva. <laughs> we all know how you feel, Rick. <laughs> All right, listen, guys, we have a great show tonight. Three outstanding guests. Joe Russo coming up in a few minutes. He is the author and archivist of The Rascals. Uh, after him, we're going to have Mr. Shelley Harris, a.k.a. Angry Black from The Howard Stern Show. We're going to finish up with Tommy Marr, the Woodstock guru, great singer. A lot of cool things to talk about tonight. So, Rick, let's begin, shall we? Good. We can finally start the big meeting. Daddy, Chuck. Let's begin, shall we?
and that is C S E E by the Rascals, and that just happens to be one of the all-time favorite Rascals songs of my first guest. He's with us right now, author, archivist of the Rascals, Mr. Joe Russo. Joe, thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. It's uh, it's a pleasure to talk about the rascals oh always pleasure to listen to them too first of all before i ask you about your new book about the rascals uh what is it about the song c that you kind of put above a lot of the other rascals so, i mean there's it's impossible to choose but why c well I, I chose that because number one it's not one of the you know tried and true number one you know all popular songs but i think it was the the, the song that never was that should have been one of their classic, you know, uh, worldwide hits. For some reason, that song slipped between the cracks, uh, and a lot of fans recognize it as a, a milestone uh, track of their of their career, and certainly one of the better uh, songs from their late, last two albums. And uh, they do it in their current show. They close the entire show with it. So it does it, it does have uh, a lot of people who revere it as the, uh, the incredibly powerful track that I think it is. Yeah, and apparently they realize a lot of people re- revere it, too. You know, speaking of the current show, Joe, you have a brand new book out that sold exclusively, at this time anyway, at the uh, Rascals Broadway show and at the Broadway, at the, uh, at the Rascals concerts. It's called The Rascals, a visual biography by Joe Russo with a foreword by Stephen Van Zandt. Joe, I bought the book. I actually tracked you down at one of the Rascals concerts. You were nice enough to sign it. Tell us all about this beautiful, beautiful book. Well, uh, about 30-some-odd years ago, Eddie Brigatti and I formed this little organi- private organization we called the Rascals Archives, and that was to try to collect and, and archive and document the Rascals' career, which had never been properly cared for during their tenure as a band in the 60s. So I've been working literally for 30 plus years uh, collecting the Rascals' history, uh, wow. visually, photographs, audio, video, you know, uh, interviews, uh, published material, uh, articles, etc. So <clears throat> being a, um, a designer of sorts, and I have authored about six or seven other books, it was always my dream to, you know, being the archivist, to do the book on the Rascals. There had never mm-hmm. been one done. I'd written some liner notes. I'd written liner notes on a few of the packages, and I basically had something to do with all the reissues in the 80s, but, you know, a book is really what I felt the band deserved. So I discussed this with Stephen Van Zandt, and obviously that the, Rask- the Rascals were going to be going back out. At that time, when we started doing the book, I started in October of last year, there were really only three shows that were committed to, which were the three at the Capitol Theater in, and, and, um, I forget the name of the town in New York, uh, Portchester, and we didn't know if it would go beyond that. So we kind of put it all together, and then when the Broadway uh, run came up, which was, uh, I believe in April and May, we had the book for sale at the shows, and it was snapped up, and the fans love it, and it's been for sale at every show ever since. And uh, people ask if it's going to be available online and so forth. I don't have the answer to that. It's not on Amazon. It's not anywhere but the Rascal shows right now. I mean, I would imagine down the road we will put it on Little Steven's website. Um, but uh, right now it's only available at the Rascal concerts. I guess that's what makes the concerts even more special at this point. But, Joe, I cannot see them not eventually making this available through Amazon and all. I mean, the pages are glossy. I mean, they're beautiful pages. The pictures are – I've never seen – I don't know if I've seen – 99% 99% of these pictures. Well, not, not, neither did anybody else. They're, they're told <laughs> okay. from, from very rare sources. Uh, basically, the book is 9 by 12, so it's larger than the average photo book. It's 9 by 12. It's hardcover. It's got over 200 glossy pages, as you said, and it covers the Rascal's career, actually from pre-Rascal. There's some early pre-Rascal pictures of each of the guys and the uh, various bands that they were involved in prior to forming. And then it goes straight through, literally, to the 2012-2013 uh, Richard Rogers concerts. And it's the entire history of the band in photographs. Uh, in the recording studio, uh, in concert, portraits, candids. Uh, there's all the chart history. I did a, um, uh, the text was co-authored by um, a guy named Kevin Finney. And we talk all about each record release and the impact of their music. 
And uh, it's a good primer to hopefully probably another book that will come out down the road. But this was the um, oh. visual history. So people unfamiliar or because the radical material is so rare, it's a great source to, uh, to see and hear uh, about everything that happened uh, chronologically uh, I, in a I, kind of succinct manner. I mean, the opening, like you just said, with, that you co-wrote with Kevin Finney, uh, Endlessly Grooving, I believe the passage is called. It's yeah, That alone, it's, I mean, is there's so much info just in that alone, not even the pictures. I mean, it's the, uh, it is so well worth owning, not only for Rascals fans, just for pop music fans. Well, thank you. I, I, that's what we uh, set out to do, and uh, so far all the fans have just loved it because Rascal material is very hard to come by. There's been never been a book of any kind. There's never been a, any kind of documentary uh, retrospective of them at all. So this is a good place to start. Start, my gosh! If this is the start, I could imagine what's what's. Well, we got up. lots more stuff, fortunately, and hopefully they'll keep going, and uh, more of a demand will be uh, created commercially to, for, to produce more things like this. Yeah, you know, speaking That's my of that, idea. That's my dream to to. Uh, Eventually, put a, a video, a documentary together oh, on their boy. career. I think that's well, well uh, deserved and long overdue. Yeah, and that would be well received. So, you know, you mentioned, um, will there be more shows down the road? What have you heard? Well, yeah, I they think they have commitments. Months. I think they've commenced through next year. I mean, I know they're coming back to Broadway. Um, I think they're going to Atlantic City. Um, and they're going to revisit you know, a lot of the venues that they did so well at previously. I believe the uh, Academy of Music in Philly is one of them. So, yeah, the, the, the options are endless right now. I mean, the, the, everywhere they've performed has been a smash. They just finished, uh, I think, two weeks in Canada, which was a, you know, a, a touchy market. Who knew how well they were going to do in Canada? Mm -hmm. uh, but they sold out 95% of the shows and got an amazing press, amazing reaction. So they're just ringing all the bells and scoring uh, bullseyes wherever they perform. Every show has been standing ovations unanimously across the board. And everyone's just absolutely overwhelmed uh, at how great they still sound, how great they still perform. Uh, Attendance-wise, it, it's spectacular. The reviews are spectacular. They were on the Tony Awards. Uh, mm -hmm. They did a great sh performance there. So, I mean, it's just absolutely a dream come true and just beyond anyone's expectations, including the producers of the show, right? And just nobody realized, <laughs> or, you know, I mean, we all had our hopes, we all had our, right. our ambitions, but when it actually surpasses your wildest dreams, then it's really, you just, you know, you just gotta, <laughs> you just gotta be amazed, and everybody yeah, I mean, is ev amazed. Sure, everyone's a little older, but I'll tell you, I have to be honest with you, when I saw the show on Broadway, I knew eventually uh, Eddie Brigatti was gonna sing How Can I Be Sure, which is my personal favorite rascal song and i said you know can he hit the notes is he gonna do it and he nailed it joe i, I don't have to tell you i, I we were at the same show well, I saw i'll you the tell other you night. why he nailed it i'll tell you why he nailed it because he worked he worked for two years he worked he took lessons he worked he practiced he uh, changed his lifestyle around he he just worked and worked because he knew when it was called upon him to do that that it was going to be a poignant and important moment in the show, and he does not let the audience down. Boy. He comes across every show. He's gotten a standing ovation. I'm so proud of him. Uh, I can't tell you. I mean, it, it's just absolutely a show-stopping moment. There are a lot of sh show-stopping moments in the show, but he worked. He worked to achieve that. He hadn't sung that many shows in, in a row. None of them had performed this heavily. In fact, it's a joke. I was telling the guys that, you know, in the 60s, when they were in their 20s, they performed for 55 to 65 minutes. Now they're, you know, 69, 70, and they're performing for two, two hours and 15 minutes <laughs> and doing songs that they never even performed in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So it, that's just another, uh, another uh, angle to why this uh, reunion is such an absolute, you know, show-stopping, amazing show. You know what else is amazing, Joe, is uh, you know better than just about anybody listening, that they weren't always, uh, they, they had broken up, the group had, they weren't always um, compatible, should we say. No, there was, a lot, there was a lot happened, of years, though? yeah, there were a lot of years that got squandered and lost, and that's, that's brought up in the show and discussed in the show. Yeah. As you know, the show is a multimedia uh, event. In, in addition to the live rascals being on stage, there are 
there's a giant 50 foot screen where vintage footage is shown and the rascals talk directly to the audience uh, via uh, video clips and it basically tells the story of the band and so a lot of that is brought up and uh, there's a piece at the end where they discuss you know the years the lost years which they say a uh, 70s oh yeah the 80s yeah yeah the 90s oh and the 2000s <laughs> right. you know it's like a running that show but yeah there, there were a lot of years where uh, just the, the, the problems of, of what split the band up in the 60s were never really resolved and uh, they just, you know, the different factions would get together, like Gene, uh, Dino, and Felix performed at one point, and then Gene and Dino performed on their own, and then Eddie would do his thing. And, and you know, so never together, never, never all four together. And the, the prerequisite was that it was equal. And when Stephen Van Sant said, yes, this is going to be equal, all four guys are equal, that was basically all it took. Mm-hmm. And once that was uh, promised, and once... Uh, the production was, uh, uh, you know, going to be uh, live up to the uh, requirements of a modern performance with backup singing and, uh, you know, support so that the songs could be replicated uh, to a T. Then, then it was really not that big a deal. It happened very quickly. Mm-hmm. I, I guess that was one of the problems when they broke up. It wasn't one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. Is that? Basically, well, it, 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 you know, we just lost Sid Bernstein, who was their manager. Oh. So rest his soul. Uh, Sid was a great promoter, and when you met him, he was a huge name in the business. But similar to how Colonel Parker lost his effectiveness in in managing Elvis, that's kind of what happened with Sid. Uh, he didn't really have the wherewithal to really handle a group of this magnitude. Uh, that the rascals quickly became. He, they quickly outgrew his his ability to manage, and so they wound up being mismanaged. And Sid was not a dishonest or a, a, a corrupt person, but he turned out to be an incompetent person as far mm-hmm. as managing these four young kids. And so basically, I'd have to say that is the crux of what happened to cause the breakup. Mm. Now, and, uh, you know, it, it never resolved itself until recently. I know the Rascals were at the Beatles concert in Shea Stadium. Right. Um, there's, I, I believe it's a picture in the book, or maybe it was just shown at the uh, at the concert. Could you tell oh, our yeah. listeners? It's, it's in the, it's in the show. About? I, I searched forty years for that picture. I, I, I it was a it was a uh, an obsession of mine to come <laughs> up with the photograph where on the Beatles Shea Stadium scoreboard, Sid Bernstein had it flashed. The Rascals are coming. <laughs> that was his entree to publicize the fact that you know he would be bringing the, the uh, Rascals up uh, as an up and coming group, and I finally found the, the the picture of the scoreboard at Shea Stadium, and that is in the show. It is a, I mean, it's a classic picture because so many of us have heard about that, but to actually see exactly, it, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, Joe, um, you have. I mean, you, you're perfect for this show because you are a pop culture aficionado. I mean, you've written so many pop culture books. Um, tell us some of the other books you've written, and then we're going to get back to The Rascals. But I want to make sure in my listeners, when they go on Amazon.com, they can find all these books. Why don't you uh, Yeah, well, some of, some of them are available and some of them aren't. Uh, the most famous one probably is Planet of the Apes Revisited, which was published in 2001. And that was a book that was uh, 17 years in the making, which, which was the uh, uh, documenting all documenting all the uh, Planet of the Apes films, the five classic films that were released 68 through 73. And we interviewed all the people in, that were involved in the production of those films, and Charlton Heston wrote the foreword for us. And um, I wound up being uh, uh, interviewed on the Blu-ray documentaries for that the Planet of the Apes through that uh, book, which is considered oh. more or less the uh, Bible on the uh, making of the, those classic ape films. Oh, really? You're, you're interviewed on the Blu-ray? Yeah. Oh, cool. And also I did uh, a couple books on Elvis Presley. I did one called Elvis Straight Up with Joe Esposito, who was Elvis's uh, right-hand man, as they say. I also did a little book with Dr. Nick. I was supposed to do a major book with Dr. Nick, but uh, that's uh, another story for another show. <laughs> I did a book on the monkeys. I did one on Jim Morrison. Um, what's what's the Jim Morrison one? My eyes. That's called My Eyes Have Seen You. It's uh, Robbie Krieger called it the best doors book he'd ever seen. It's basically mm-hmm. that book is basically rare 
uh, uh, photographs. It very it goes for like seven hundred dollars on. What did Robbie Krieger call it? The best book you ever saw in the doors. What? Now coming from Robbie that was Krieger. A direct quote from him. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I was going to say, coming from Robbie Krieger, yeah. I mean, that, that says all you need to know about my eyes have seen you. Then I did a coffee table book called Elvis Something for Everybody, and most recently is, is the Rascal book. What's Joe Esposito like? Uh, what's Joe Esposito like? Um, Next question, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tell us pretty much all we need to know. Um, what um, what would you say uh, the chances are of there being a live album? Oh, you know what, Joe? If if you don't mind, I I got some um, emails from people, and that's one of the questions. May I ask you a couple of questions that was sent to sure, us? Sure, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is from Paris Stachitaris, I believe. Sorry, Paris, if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. But uh, there's a few questions here. Um, any chance that the Rascals re will record a new album? and release it to the fans in the near future. Do you know anything about that? Okay, well, I, I, every single show the Rascals have done thus far has been recorded. So all the, sh all the new 2012, 2013 shows are being recorded. So I, I, I would absolutely uh, almost guarantee you that somewhere down the line, a live album will be assembled from the, you know, the new 2012, 2013 shows. Excellent. Paris also wants to know, <laughs> speaking of live albums, did they ever record a live album back in the 60s that you think might see the light of day? Well, that's the tragedy of the Rascals, is that they were never captured live. Because live, they were, if you thought they were good on record, they, they killed live. Hmm. There were numerous attempts to record the Rascals live. The first one being in 1965, even before they were signed to Atlantic, Atlantic recorded them at the Barge, which is basically where Sid Bernstein discovered them in Long Island in 1965. So there were a bunch of recordings made there, fortunately, that survive. So there's a possibility those can come out. We've discussed the, it. It's been, it's been discussed. The barge in uh, West Hampton, other, New York. Other re sorry? I'm sorry. The barge in West Hampton, New York we're talking about? Yeah, yep, yep. that's where they were discovered. There were a bunch of live recordings that Tom Dowd from Atlantic recorded. Uh, now, it's interesting about those recordings is a lot of the stuff uh, they never recorded in any other form. There's a lot of cover versions, like they do with the Beatles' No Reply. They do, um, wow. yeah, they do uh, See About Me by the Supremes. They do Tom Jones songs. They do Good Lovin', and they do, uh, you know, I Believe, uh, I Believe, and a couple things that were on their first album. But more often than not, the stuff recorded at the barge that never exists in any other form. So there's a lot of one-of-a-kind live performances that were done at the barge, which makes those very unique. Um, they were recorded in 66 on stage at the Brooklyn Fox. They were recorded at the Garden State Art Center in 1968. Now, unfortunately, all these tapes that I'm talking about, save for the barge ones, which were in a different area, and that's why they weren't destroyed, were burned up in a, in a fire that the Atlantic, Atlantic Records had in the 70s. Multi-tracks to everything. Uh, I, 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 perished along with a lot of other classic uh, album uh, artists, so that's why the archives has been seeking, uh, you know, any kind of live recordings of tapes or things, because the Rascals, uh, with little, with precious little, was recorded is destroyed, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so that's the sad fact. Uh, maybe somebody somewhere has a soundboard, or you know, this is what I've been searching for for forty years. Somebody somehow out there somewhere has must have something but mm -hmm. it's few and far between that i've come up i've come up with some audience recordings some decent stuff um but nothing you know pristine multi-track recordings they just don't exist yeah i have another email here and i want to thank all of my listeners um my email address is on the website everybody planetludwig.com any guests that we have like we say just let me know and thankfully joe you have a following here because they've sent some emails here's one from sure. Rich Cervone, okay? And he said, uh, if anyone knows about the Rascals, it's Joe Russo or maybe his brother Mike. Uh, here's, here's what Rich asked. Meaning, and, meaning Rich's brother, not Mike. I don't have a brother, Mike. <laughs> meaning Rich's brother, Mike, right. Not, right. not Mike Russo, Mike right. Cervone. Um, 
looking forward to the interview with Joe Russo. Rumor has it here in Mayapak, about 50 miles north of New York City, that in the early 60s, the Rascals did three performances in one day in the area. One was in Peekskill, then in a pizzeria in Mayapak, and then at a Carmel Hall. Do you know anything, or can you confirm or deny any of this, Joe? Or do you know even if the Rascals did multiple shows at all, anywhere? The Rascals played some odd venues, but a pizzeria, that's a new one. <laughs> um, I, I have their, I have Where their would you itinerary. expect Italian boys to be, Joe? I understand <laughs> that they probably frequented a lot of pizzerias, but I don't think they ever performed in one. Um, I looked, I have their itinerary in front of me, actually, that begins in October of 1966. And I perused this looking for any remnant of uh, information on these towns and these venues, and I don't see it. So it's not to say that it wasn't impossible, because they did a hell of a lot of shows especially in the early days of 66. So it is possible. Uh, mm-hmm. What I'm going to ask him is where he heard from, heard this from and uh, what other details yeah. he might have. Well, he said it was, but, it was uh, I, I don't have a concrete answer for that other than, you know, it's very, it is possible because they, they had a mad, a mad schedule on the East Coast back mm-hmm. then. Joe, I, mean, I can't believe we're up against the clock. Now you have... I, I would love, can you come back and talk to us at, more about The Rascals, but also about The Planet of the Apes, one of my all-time favorite sci-fi movies. And I know you are a, a, a monkey's archivist and, and mm-hmm. scholar. Could we talk, could you come back a couple times and talk about each of those for us? Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. Thanks. But Joe, before I let you go, uh, let our listeners know where they can reach uh, you or about the ra- uh, the Rascals the visual biography? Where can they go? Facebook or Well, website? we have a Facebook. It's called the Rascals, but there's various Facebook people that call themselves the Rascals, but ours is the one with the little cartoon of them on it, and it says the Rascals Archives on the uh, avatar. The uh, official website is the rascalsarchives.com. That's the mm-hmm. Rascals with an S, archives with an S, dot com. And then the direct email is the rascals archives at yahoo.com. Okay, great. And by the way, listeners, these, uh, these links are on our website at planetludwig.com too. And Joe, I just want the listeners to know when I had asked you uh, a while ago if you'd be on the show, you were just so cool about it. You said, yep, you just tell me when. So I really appreciate it. And I really My look pleasure. forward to you. Oh, thanks, Joe. And we really look forward to hearing your monkey stories. Speaking of monkeys, Planet of the Apes, <laughs> and some of your other books. All right, Joe? And I want to thank all the fans for, for coming out and supporting the Rascals and making all these shows a success, because without them, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have gone this long, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to continue further. So I'm grateful, just personally for that, that they're out there, and they're having a great time, and they're getting the uh, respect that they earned so many years ago, but I don't believe they ever totally received. So it's the fans that have always kept their music alive, and now they're keeping the concerts going. So it's really thanks to them. So I want to thank all the fans. And remember, guys, at the concerts, look for The Rascals, a visual biography by Joe Russo. You will not be sorry you picked it up. It's a beautiful book. Thanks again, Joe, for being on. All right, Steve. We'll talk next time. Absolutely. Thanks, Joe. You say you have animation needs. Hey, it's nothing to be ashamed of. We all have animation needs. We all have comic book needs. We need comics. We need figurines. We need toys. Well, A&S Comics to the rescue. That's right. A&S Comics, our friend Tony DeMarco, will make sure all your animation needs are met. Just go to ASComics.com and they ship worldwide. That's right. If you're in Europe and you want a comic book, you want your Archie and Jughead series number 17, Tony DeMarco will make sure you get it. He'll swim if he has to. If the ship has already left port, Tony DeMarco will swim these comics over to you. They might get a little wet because Tony needs two hands to swim. But the point is, you will get anything you want anywhere in the world from ASComics.com. All right, now, you've, it's been years. You've had all these comics and toys and figurines building up, and you said, you know, there's not enough room here. I have to move. How am I going to get all this stuff out of my house? That's when our friends ABC Movers and Shakers.com help you out. That's right. ABC Movers and Shakers.com. They'll move all your furniture. They'll move your rugs. They'll move your four dogs. They'll move your comic books. 
Just go to abcmoversandshakers.com for a free price quote. They have been in the business for years. They're a new company, but the owners have been in the moving business for years. They know just what they're doing. Archie and Jughead will be delivered safely to wherever you want. And long day. You've read your comics. The moving men have taken everything out of your old house. You're sitting there all alone. What do you want? A nice cold drink of Flaco Coquito. That's right. Go to flacococoquito.com. F-L-A-C-O-C-O-Q-U-I-T-O.com. Flaco Coquito is the healthier rum. Just what you need. And now you're all relaxed. You're sitting in front of your pewter. What do you want to do? Well, you're going to watch legendstv.net. That's right. Evan Ginsberg's Legends TV. You can watch it on MadhouseTV.com. Every show is different. There's always an eclectic group of guests from magicians to singers to dancers to rappers to comedians. Evan Ginsberg's LegendsTV.net. Go to it on MadhouseTV.com. Watch it live Saturdays, 11 a.m. to noon Eastern Standard Time. Then watch it on archives anytime you want afterwards on MadhouseTV.com or LegendsTV.com. And hey, guess what else? I'm Evan's co-host on LegendsTV.net. That's right. You get to see my goofy face rather than just hear my dopey voice. Yeah, speaking of my dopey voice, um, I actually said legendstv.com. It's legendstv.net, guys, okay? okay. Now, uh, before we speak with my next guest, the one and only Shelly Harris, a.k.a. Angry Black, uh, last okay. week we wished good luck to a, a dear friend of the show, a loyal listener, Joanna Martel. Right. She had a procedure last week, and glad to say she pulled through it with flying colors and all of her loved ones and especially all her friends on Five Chadwick at Holy Name Hospital in Teaneck are just overjoyed for her. Also, another loyal listener, I want to wish a very happy birthday to Ms. Heather Rico. Happy birthday, Heather. And as a birthday present, Heather, I have the one and only Angry Black on the line right here, Shelly Harris. Shelly, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you uh, for allowing allowing me to come on, man. How are you, buddy? I'm doing fine. You know, Shelly, I was thinking we actually know each other for about 20 years. Could it be that long? I would have to say it's probably longer than 20 years. I would have to say, dare say, I'm going to say 93, perhaps, 91 or 92, we go back. Because you used to own a little video store in Hackensack on Anderson Street called Video Street, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. You're right. Yeah. And I think you... you were a loyal customer. That's right. Me and Uncle, me and Uncle Bernard, God rest his soul. Oh, yeah. God rest, God rest his soul is right. Yep. Now. And they, some people don't remember something called VHS tapes, but, uh, you know, we do. We do. Yeah, VHS. I think even the beta was supposed to be the better ones, weren't they? But, you yeah, know. yeah, they said beta was going to last, but that went the way of the dinosaur. <laughs> that went the way of VHS. Now, listen, Shell, I want to tell our yeah. listeners, too, I, my my guest before you, Joe Russo, was such a cool guy when I asked him to be on. And everybody, I want you to know, when I got in touch with Shelly a while ago to be on the show, the first thing he said was, tell me when I'm there. So Shelly, you're, you're, you're really a, a good guy, and I want to thank you for coming on. I always tell now, everybody that uh, some people say that when my time is done, there'll be a few people at my grave site that'll say nice things, and I think you'll be one of them. Ah, you, you bet. Absolutely. You've always been a great guy. One of the funniest guys I know, as a matter of fact. Your name, your, your uh, Howard Stern show name, Angry Black, you're anything but an angry black guy, at least when we were around me. How did that – take us from the very beginning, Shelley. how it started well, with it, Howard Stern, and you take us through it. All right. It started almost 20 years ago. When I first appeared on the Howard Stern show, I appeared on the old Madison Avenue uh, uh, studio location. And we played a game called Guess the Criminal. That's where Howard and uh, I believe Robin and a couple other guys, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Stutter and John, they picked myself and four other black men out of a lineup guessing our background, trying to see if, you know, I had a criminal background, which, of course, I don't. And Howard, of course, picked me. I guess that's just because of the way I looked and stuff. That was, that was my first appearance on the show. Now, I had a different career path at the time, and it didn't work out. So when I lost that job... 
I got mad at everybody. I got mad at the world, and I got angry. And that's when I said, you know what? F this. I'm angry black. Kelly the angry black. And it 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 stuck too. It now stuck. it stuck. What? Uh, but you weren't. But you didn't call yourself angry black when you first went on the show in '93, right? No. It, 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 when when did you become angry that, black? I became angry black when I when the insane clown posse popped into the Howard Stern show, and it's been a, it's made the rounds of the internet. You know, and they were, I remember driving into the city for something. I was in my Honda Prelude, and they were popping off on the air that they'll kick this guy's ass, they'll kick anybody's ass, this and that. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know, I'm not too far from the studio. Let me go down there and see if I can pull the car to these two, you know, no pun intended, clowns. <laughs> sure enough, I pulled their card, and it was one of the highest grid shows on the old e network, I was told. I remember it. That was I really first, do. That was my. Yeah, that was my first appearance on the show as Shelly the Angry Black or Angry Black. And uh, it was it was quite memorable. It was. Now, you know, speaking of memorable, it, I'm, I, I'm getting ahead of myself again. When you were first on with Guess the Criminal, what was it like when you walked into the studio and there is Howard Stern? Like, what was your first reaction? Look, now, I'm, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it. I'm going to give it to you straight. Uh, a friend of mine who works for the Bergen County Sheriff's Department, uh, Detective Ed Brunner, he used to listen to Howard all the time. I said, well, I really don't listen to Howard. So he said, no, you got to listen. That's funny. Whatever. I said, okay. Long story short, I get picked for Guess the Criminal. I remember walking down that hallway into the studio, and I was the first person in line because I wanted to walk through that door. When I walked through the door, and I saw him sitting there, and I remember saying to myself, as I walked through the door, I said, I'm standing less than, I'm going to say, five feet away from probably the guy that changed the face of radio with honesty, with humor, with uh, determination. And, and I'm in his presence, and he's, he's talking to me, and I'm, I'm talking to him, and he's allowing me to express myself, and I'm trying to be funny a little bit, and this and that. And I, I, was, I was in complete utter awe. I mean, I mean that's mm-hmm. just how it's stirred. I mean, yeah, you got to understand something. There, there are certain people that make it in the industry that go through life. There's, there's Frank Sinatra, that oh, was a press lead. Matt King Cole, or there's sports figures. The Beatles, Shelly. The Beatles, Shelly. The the Beatles. Thank you, you, Shelly. This man changed the face of radio, and and I'm standing in his presence. And it it was, it was, it was, it was chilling. It it, it was, it was. I was all shocked. I mean, if that's the word you could say. Mm Mm-hmm. I I agree with you. I mean, he has changed the face of talk radio now. Everyone copies Howard, and I think he gets lost in the shuffle. Like he's the originator of what we think of as talk radio today. Now, how were you picked, by the way, to be? Guess the criminal. It was, it was, I, still, I still remember. I, I was unemployed at the time, and I'm listening to the show. And he's a Howard, if I recall correctly, said, I can pick out anybody that's got a criminal record. Black, white, Hispanic, it don't matter. And I'm laughing. I said, well, I don't got a criminal record. Let's see if he can pick me out. And I called the show, and Stuttering John answered. He was an intern at the time. I think he was an unpaid, unpaid intern. And he said, do you have a criminal record? And I said, no, I don't. I want to prove that Howard could be wrong. At which point, John said, let me take your number, I'll call you back. He called me back a day later, and my late mother said, Shelly, some guy from the Howard Stern show, and, you know, I, <laughs> it's like prom night, bro. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, right. And I, I, I said, what? And I called back the number, and John answered the phone. He said, we'd like you to come in. And I'm looking at the date right now, 7 a.m. September 23rd. I have it written down on something in my uh, humble abode. I went over there, and... and uh, I, it was just, it, it, again, meeting someone that you admire, that you appreciate, if you want to do radio, if you want to do TV, and, and you're standing there, and he's talking, and it, it's, it was incredible. And I still feel the same way whenever I'm mentioned by him or if he takes one of my phone calls or someone mm-hmm. comments. Yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, one of your heroes, Frank Sinatra. You are a huge Rat Pack fan, aren't you? I, I, I love... You know, what's the term? My, my music uh, taste is eclectic, I believe. Is that, is that that's the word? Exact, I, yep, that's the perfect word. I, I listen to everything. Rap, Jay-Z, you know, classic rap, public enemy. I love Francis Albert Sinatra. And on Twitter, I follow his very, very lovely daughter, Nancy Sinatra. And she's replied to me a few times on Twitter. Very sweet woman. And that's why I, I actually tease all the time and say I wish that her late dad was alive so he could punch Harry Connick in the mouth. Because... <laughs> This, this cat just don't get it. It's there's the angry black we love. There's yeah, the angry I mean, black. I, 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 I got to keep it real. I mean, there's only one Francis Alvis Sinatra. There's only one. There was only the Beatles, Elvis Presley, mm-hmm. 
you know, Michael Jackson. And, it, I, I, and, and I always tweet out on Sunday. Sunday is my Sinatra. Sunday with Sinatra. If I'm not working, I'm driving around. I got Frank playing. Shelly, is there a funny? Performer. Was there a funnier guy than Dean Martin too? I mean, what and, and Sammy Davis? I, what, a, what a trio they I've made! I've got I've got a CD, Rat Pack at the Sands, live at the Sands, 1961, I believe, and they did Sammy the business, and it was a different time then. It was a different time, you know. You could say certain things, and, and but they loved the man. They loved each other, and there's, I'm going to just say the one line where Sammy was doing his impressions, and Sammy replied, said, uh, "Mr. Dean Martin," and Dean said from the audience, "This better be good, buddy." Six of your friends are going to be carrying you by the handles. And everybody's laughing. And Frank goes, six of your best friends. And then there's only two of us in here we know of, and we ain't too sure about that. I mean, it was just, it was a glorious time. They were glorious performers. And, and, and I, I love them. I love them. I'm, I'm Frank Dean, Sammy. The, the performances were incredible. Incredible. You know, you mentioned, uh, and I, I see you and Nancy Sinatra tweet back and forth. Well, while we're at it, what is? Why don't you tell the audience your your Twitter name so they can uh, they can follow you? Oh, I'd appreciate that. It's Angry Black T H S S. That's four capital letters. Angry Angry Black lowercase T H S S. Okay, if you so want to follow me on Twitter. Just hit me up, I'll, and I'll follow you back. I am a follower of Shelly, everybody, and I'm telling you, he comes up with some of the greatest tweets you'd ever want to read. I mean, he speaks his mind. He's uh, Anything that's on his mind, Shelly, you don't hold back, but that's what makes you so uh, cool yeah, to, yeah, to follow I, on, so, on Twitter. Some people say I have no filter. I, I have a slight filter. But it's very small, but for the most part, I'm you know honest. I'm fair. I mean, I call it the way I see it. I don't necessarily you know take the black man's side wrong or she's wrong or the white man side if he's wrong or she's wrong. I call it the way I see it. It is what it is. It is what it is. You're absolutely right because I know on, on Twitter, you you know no skin color is right. I mean, if it's a black guy, white guy, Asian, no matter what, if the guy's wrong, you, you call him out on the carpet for it. You call, you call him out on the carpet. Now, a few years ago, Shelly, no, a few years ago, my gosh, I guess 94, your very, very famous fight with Crazy Cabby. Actually, that was in 2001, April of 2001. We got like I said, back. in 2001, Shelly. Yeah, you're, yeah that's you're, right, of course. That's right, that's <laughs> right, I do. Oh, wait, 94 is when we met? No. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those. It's so long ago. It's so long anyway, ago. like I was saying, it, like I was saying, in 2001, Shelly, you had your uh, this really famous fight with Crazy Cabby, and I want to tell the audience, Shelly was nice enough to allow me to come to the fight, but... Tell us about it, Shelley. Those who aren't familiar with it, and actually those who are familiar with it, they'd love to hear the insides, inside story. Well, there was a, there's always been like a little bit of a beef between me and Caddy. So like whenever I would go over to the Stern Show trying to submit things to Gary, you know, maybe get played on the air or try to give him a bit, you know, he would walk by, hey, angry black, watch out, I don't want him to get angry at me. You know, and I kind of took it as a, you know, a bit of a slight. So one day he was in the studio, and I came over there, and I had it out with him. I said, listen, you know, let's get it on. Let's, let's fight. Let's have a boxing match. And I was like, are you serious? You want to have it? I said, five rounds, two minutes. What do you want to do, Caddy? He said, two minute rounds. All right, we'll do it. I trained. He didn't train, but it was evident by the e, uh, documentary. And we had one of the biggest <laughs> events in Stern Show history, you know, and they showed it on the Jumbotron in Times Square in 2001. So when, I, when the fight was over, everything, we were all off the air. I'm walking out with my friends and family, and all these people on the street are like, hey, congratulations, it shouldn't have been a draw. You should have won it. We thought you took three out of two. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because the fight, it wasn't just on K-Rock, not even K-Rock, it was on the Jumbotron. And we all had a great morning that, that day. I mean, my brother was there, my sister, Steve, everybody. And, and, you know, at the end, Howard was gracious enough. As he always is, taking pictures with fans. Steve was he jumped in the ring and got a couple yep. of snapshots with the big man. And, and and again, it was it was a big event. Again, I thought I took three out of two. They called it a draw, but the fact of the matter is, you know, it still was something that no. I enjoyed and the fans, as well as I, again, thanking Howard for allowing me to do it. No, you you won the fight, Chili. I'm, t- I'm not saying just because we're friends either. It was pretty clear. But you know, you said Howard was a great guy, letting Steve come in the ring and, and take a picture with him. Actually, Shelly, I'm going to tell it the way it is. I was standing outside the ring. Shelly was in the ring with Howard after the fight, and Shelly insisted. He said, "Steve, get up here." I said, "Nah, nah, get your ass up here." And you're the one that allowed me to have a picture take with Howard. So, 
Angry Black, I'm telling everybody, he is one very cool guy, and I, I really, uh, really appreciate that, too. And I have the picture. I even have it on, uh, on my website. But I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, – mention a couple of names, Shelly, and uh, tell me what you, what you think of them. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Ronnie the Limo Driver. Ronnie the Limo Driver. Uh, Ronbo, as Howard calls him, Ronnie is a good guy, and he's like me now. He's, uh, he's an older gentleman, and he's dating a much younger girl like I am. Mm-hmm. Ronnie likes to have fun. Ronnie likes to, you know, enjoy his life. And one of the best times I ever had with Ronnie was when Howard took the show out to Las Vegas in 2003. I'm terrified of flying. I took the train across country to sleep a car and everything, whatever. Rodney and I, Ralph, Artie Lang, one of the greatest moments, uh, Irish John at the Circle Bar at the Hard Rock Cafe, 3, 4 in the morning, drinking every night. <laughs> you know, women, you know, n- n- nothing's going on. Women throwing themselves at us because, you know, in their eyes, we're somewhat celebrities. I don't think I'm a celebrity. I'm a Glenn's baby. But you know, he's, just, he's a good, good dude, and he's a very loyal uh, friend to Howard, you know, as well as an employee. And I, 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 you'll never hear me say anything bad about Rombo. You'll never hear me say anything bad. Because I, 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 when we follow each other on Twitter, and I actually tweeted from a few weeks ago that he was my nigga, which in mm-hmm. A, you know, N I W G A, and he talked about it on the wrap up show, said Angry Black tweeted me saying that, you know, he and his girlfriend did something and he called me my nigga. What does that mean? Am I part of his team? And Gary just laughed and said, yeah, you are. He said, oh, okay. Well, I told him to calm down with that just a little bit. I was like, he's still my nigga. Rombo's a great guy. Yeah, you know, my, my wife Sue and I went to a couple of the um, America's Got Talent shows last year when they were in Newark. And I think Ronnie might come across as somewhat of a, not a goofball, but you know, but he is all business when it comes to protecting Howard. Have you found that too? Yes, he is always business. And, and Howard, you know, he breaks his walls. But Howard always will say on the air, he goes, no, Ronnie, he's doing his job. Trust me, I, I've heard a story. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm not going to repeat it. But I heard there was something that where Ronnie may have, could have been possibly injured. You know, this is years ago. I don't know if it's true or not. But that tells you the type of person he is. That tells you the type of loyalty and the type of, you know, man he is. I mean. Top notch. You know, he takes a lot of crap from the fans, you know, you know, and from people breaking his balls, calls in, but he's a good dude. He really is. You know, Shell, I think the audience would like to know, now, you're, you're not Angry Black 24-7. Well, you are Angry Black 24-7, but what, uh, what line of work are you in? I'm a unionized employee for Verizon. I've got 16 years vested in my company, my great company. And I'm still strong enough to do another 14, hopefully retire. Life's blood in that company. Great company to work for. And I, I do get recognized from time to time, either by my voice or face. And they go, hey, aren't you? And they whisper. I said, no, it's okay. You can say it loud. They start laughing. Said, yeah, I'm a big Stern fan. It's nice to meet you. I heard you work for the phone company. Said, yeah, 16 years. That's the union employee. Said, Does that- but you don't seem so angry now. I said, well, I'm, I'm Clark Kent now, ma'am. And she starts <laughs> laughing. I said, when well, I'm on the air, I said, I'm a super man. I said, right now, ma'am, I'm all business. Let's get, you, let's get this Verizon Fios connected in your home. <laughs> I'll, I'll bet it never gets tired hearing people say, hey, man, I know you. You're cool. Right? Getting recognized. You know, that must feel really great. It, 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 it's, it's a good feeling. Like, sometimes, like, if I'm out of the bar and I'm sitting there and, and a woman or her friends say, I know you from somewhere. I'm like, I beat that rage charge. Oh. <laughs> I'm, up, I'm like, I'm like, you just don't get it, do you, sweetheart? I said, no. <laughs> you, you've probably seen me on television or you recognize my voice. And then be, oh, my God. Yeah, how TV or, you know, I saw you on the old E-show. Yeah, yeah, that's me. That's it. I, I thought you were, you, had, you were a garbage man. I said, no, no, my job's a wee bit more complicated than picking up garbage. That's the king of all blacks. Yeah. Shelly, you know, you have a book in you. Is that ever going to, are we ever going to see a book? You know, you're not, the only person, you're not the only person that has said that. I got guys at my shop steward at work. He's like, dude, you should write a book. I said, well, who wants to read anything I got? I don't know. You got some good stories. A lot of people, good, Shelley. You know, you know anecdotes. He said, bro, you, you got, you're, you're funny. You, 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 people actually like you. I said, yeah, maybe I'll do something. Hopefully. I, I'll, I'll obviously have to get a ghostwriter. I said, I'm, you know, that's that, that probably will have to help, but you never know. You never know. Let's say hopefully something maybe in the next three years, three or four years. Shelly, I'm telling you, that would be, you'd have a huge audience for that. You really, I would love to see a book by, by Shelly Harris, by Angry Black. I'm trying to think of what the title could be. Well, we'll come up with that. Listen, 
we're actually up against time, but Shelly, will you come back on sometime? Because I have a lot more things to talk to you about. I'd be happy to come back on. And hopefully uh, next time, uh, if there's some way we can take phone calls, somebody wants to call and ask me anything, I'd be happy to. I'll let you oh. back and call, Steve. Excellent idea. Now, listen, everybody. Once again, it's at Angry Black, T-H-S-S, caps, capital letters T-H-S-S. That's the Twitter Twitter account, at Angry Black, T-H-S-S, I guess, the Howard Stern yep. Show, T-H-S-S. The Howard how it's going, Phil. See, uh, Shelly, you, you can't follow... fool me, right? Yeah, 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 yeah man. <laughs> and you, you know how it is. And if you want to follow Marianne from Brooklyn or King of All Blacks, they're there also. And King actually writes some witty stuff. He's a pretty funny guy. It's a, it's, Shelly, it's, it's really been great talking to you, and I really appreciate you coming on. And next time, uh, we'll take a couple of phone calls from the fans. I'm sure they have a lot to ask you. Of course. And I'll be happy to do that next time, Steve Arino. All right, Shelly, it's great talking to you. Thanks again. Take care of Interviews with the greatest names in the arts and sports. Heard worldwide at legendsradio.net. The program has featured these great musical legends Ray Manzarek of the Doors, Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins, Judy Collins, Roberta Flack, and many more. Stars from movies, TV, and comedy have included Jenny McCarthy, Wayne Brady, 30 Rock's Judah Friedlander, Shelley Berman. Jackie the Joke Man Martling, David Allen Greer, and Paul Mooney. Stars of pro wrestling and MMA include Bruno Sammartino, Rowdy Roddy Piper, superstar Billy Graham, and Frank Shamrock. Co-hosted by renowned journalist Dr. Mike Leno, Legends Radio is heard Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard. We are archived 24-7 with hundreds of hours of classic interviews. Legends Radio also features the best in indie music, showcasing talent deserving wider exposure. I'm a Brooklyn baby, don't forget the gravy. We are soldiers! You missed the birth of your mother and father. Don't you dare miss Evan Ginsberg's Legends Radio.
Geld für die Schmücken. Now, was that a cooking version of Mustang Sally? And that was by my next guest, Tommy Moore. And just before I bring Tommy on, I have to mention to everyone, I forgot to mention this earlier in the show, next week we're going to 90 minutes per show. Yeah, because uh, Rick Hendrickson said, I just want to work even more, Steve. So we're going to start at 6 p.m., go to 7.30 p.m. It's 7.30 to, uh, 6.30 to 7.30, starting next week, 90 minutes. So uh, thanks, Rick, for setting that up for us. Now, my guest, Mr. Tommy Marr. Tommy, first of all, thanks for being on the show. Glad to be here, Steve. Always a pleasure. Now, who was... Who were you singing with? I mean, where was that? I mean, that was such a a great version of Mustang Sally. Well, that was I was actually uh, asked by uh, Amber Ferrari, uh, who has a group called Joplin's Pearl, which she does uh, shows in big theaters all over, all over, uh, Tatshark Theater, uh, Landmark Theater, um, Five Towns College uh, Performing Arts Center, and she sells them all out. She's amazing. She does uh, the first half of her show. She does. Um, the rock legends, Grace Slick, Stevie Nicks, the heart, you know, you name it, she does it, kills it. And then uh, half time, she takes a break and she comes out as Janis Joplin and the band comes out as Big Brother. And they do a Joplin set that just blows people away. Because, you know, you know me, Steve, I'm a Woodstock guy and uh, don't mess with Janis. But this lady can mess with Janis because she is phen- uh, phenomenal. So that's what you just heard there, I believe. If it's the one I'm thinking of, uh, it was uh, at Farrell's in uh, Belmore on Long Island. And uh, mm-hmm. I was just uh, a guest in the audience, and she asked me to come up and do a tune. And uh, that's what you got. And uh, that was the first time I ever sang with that band, ever. Well, it's obviously not the first time you ever sang, Tommy, with, with, that, with that voice of yours. It was fantastic. Tell us about your musical no, background. It's the first time I sang with that, with that right. band. I never, you know, right. I, I didn't even know what I was going to. It was just, yeah. would you come up and do it too? It's because I, I know them, you know. And, and now I actually have been working with them, you know. Uh, I do a little Joe Cocker stuff with them uh, in, in her Janus act. So nice. it's, it's been working out good. And uh, they were just up at Yazgis Farm with me too, doing the reunion show up there. The well, show. Yeah, I want to get to that in a couple of minutes with you. But you have a rich musical background. Would you? Why don't you tell some of our listeners who uh, who haven't been fortunate enough yet to to hear you and w- tell us about your musical background? Well, I mean, I've been in bands since I'm in seventh grade. I've been in probably oh god, I, I can't even imagine fifty bands probably. Um, Always, uh, you know, I'm that guy that always got close, and then somebody in the band, uh, you know something happened or whatever it was we got very close many 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 times and uh you know but i tell you the truth steve i mean i had a good job so i mean what i was doing was it was fun i got to work with a lot of great people in my life and uh and actually the older i get the more popular people i get to work with so it's actually been a great trip and a great path i've been taking and uh you know i i never really did it for the fame or anything i just do it for fun and uh I've just been a lucky guy as far as uh, being able to play with some really good people, and uh, it's been a good ride. So, and now with the uh, with the show, it's it's even more intense. So I, I have less time to go out and play because I actually had to just leave my band after uh, uh, that I was with eleven years. Called uh, well, it was uh, Vital Signs, and then we changed it to uh, the Vintage Revolution Band, which uh, I, I got to say, probably two of the best guitar players I've ever heard in my life were in that band: uh, Russell Bartizak and Kenny Loeffler. And uh, an outstanding band, but I just don't have the time to, you know, to be doing uh, gigs every week now. So I'm yeah, kind you know, of like, uh, you know. You just mentioned just your show. I have to. Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, the show. You're the host of the Maverick Soul Hour. Why don't you tell um, our listeners about that? It's on MadhouseTV.com. Why don't you take yeah, us through it? Uh, oh, I'll give you the, re- the Reader's Digest uh, version <laughs> of it. Actually, I... I how we all, how we all crossed paths was uh, I um, they, they would, we were doing we were, a lot of bands got together and decided to do uh, a a big uh, thing of against bullying. So there were six venues picked out on Long Island, and uh, I don't know how many bands were in each venue, but I was uh, doing one over in um, that page, and um, these guys Madhouse TV showed up, and they wanted to interview me, you know, and uh, they talked about. Uh, a few things that I had done, so they wanted to interview me. 
So I said, sure. And I interviewed, and the guy said, you know, uh, Tom Mill, he said, uh, you know, I really like the way you were on camera. Would you come in and do a show? I said, sure. And I went in and did a show. And then uh, a week later, he called me and said, would you co-host my show? And I did that. And then um, he offered me my own show. And I said, well, I don't know, you know. And then I thought about it. I said, sure, that'd be good. Because I do know a lot of people in the music business, a lot of people. And uh, I thought I could bring a lot to the table with uh, as far as, and not so much the name bands. Uh, what what I really enjoyed doing was exposing unnamed bands mm. to the world that would have never gotten a chance to see these people. And the show just, just blew up. It just it just took off. And I mean, I've been fortunate enough to have the Vanilla Fudge on the show. I had uh, I just had Ten Years After on my show. Wow. I mean, you know, members of Cactus have come on. Um, it, it's it's just been unbelievable. Godfrey Townsend, Led Zeppelin, not Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin, which if you guys <laughs> ever get a chance, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, for now, actually they were just over in London with Jimmy Page and Jimmy Page and um, John Paul Jones both I think produced a, a record of theirs. Phenomenal band, I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable, and uh, it's just been a good ride. And uh, like now, like the only thing I really have time to do is uh, these theater shows that I've been doing with Amber, which has been uh, a lot of fun. I'm not a big part of the show, but I'm certainly uh, I've been fun doing what I do because I love doing the Joe Cocker stuff. So, uh, you know, uh, as you can see here, I guess by the Mustang Sally, we can go with Joe Cocker. Oh. So, um, you well, know, it's it's been really, really great. And I, and I get and I get to uh, sit and listen to bands like uh, Edward Vasquez. I mean, I mean, you know, oh. two feet away from him, which blows me away. I mean, Saturday, that, that band uh, with uh, Felix Cabrera, it was incredible. So yeah, we, we, there's so yeah. many bonuses involved. Oh, it's great. We're talking about uh, Evan Ginsburg, the Legends TV show, and it's 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 produced at uh, at Madhouse TV Studios. And um, you know, another thing, Tommy, um, you mentioned, and it's so important, and I give you so much credit for this on your show, The Maverick Soul Hour. You give exposure to a lot of the indie artists, and that is so important. And I, I commend you for that. Um, now the Maverick Soul Hour is on Monday evenings, right? Why don't you tell us how right. we can how we can find that? MadhouseTV dot com, and just uh, go to the Maverick Soul Hour. It's on eight o'clock on Monday nights live. Um, and um, like I said, like I'm great I show. Everybody. Monday, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, even I'm amazed. I mean, ten years after, just on a forty-one day tour. Different city every night for 41 days. They had one day off, and they came in and did my show, which, I mean, that just blew me away. I mean, that mm. blew me away. And I got to go up and see them at Yonkers Racetrack the day before the show with uh, um, Rick Derringer, Pat Travis, uh, Ken T, Ed Gawinta, and 10 years after. So we got to hang out with all these guys. It was great. It was really, really great. And they were great guys, I got to tell you. And they just yeah. put out a great album, too. Really phenomenal. I so mean, I and so I'm blessed that I get to, you know, be around all this great talent. And, and, and like you said, Steve, you know, it's it's such a joy to, uh, you know, have a band that comes in that's playing to 30, 30 people in a club in a little gym mill somewhere and exposing them to over 100,000 on a Monday night to the world. I mean, yeah. I mean, wherever there's a computer, they can watch the show. So mm -hmm. it's been it's been a great, great thrill. I mean, you know, I, I love doing it. It's, it's a lot of fun, and I, I get great joy out of, out of giving these guys a shot, you know? You know, Tommy, you're, you're, you're being a little too modest, I have to tell our, our listeners, because you mentioned Tom Mealy. Uh, you are co-owner of Madhouse TV with Tom Mealy. But yes, you're just, I am. But you're yeah, just too yes, modest I... to say that. Listen, you know, guys, we're listening to a big man on campus here, Tommy Moore. So uh, you really are involved with the production. But you know what, Tommy? Oh, I know. Well, you, you see, uh, first hand, Steve. I'm running around all over the place with cameras and wires, and you know. You whatever know what you, you guys, whenever you watch Legends TV, and you see all those great camera angles and shots and and blends in and out. That's all Tommy Moore doing that. So he is he is a Renaissance uh, man. Well, now, it, I, it's a little it's a little so, easier for me because I can kind of tell, you know, musically where the band's going to go. So you know, with the headsets, I can just tell them, you know, camera two, three, four, whatever. And because uh, I kind of I kind of know where to go, and I know yeah. when someone's going to solo, and uh, and and I hope I do them justice, you know. You know, it's funny. The, the other day, as a matter of fact, one of uh, Edwin Vasquez Musica's uh, 
members, James Grover, we were watching afterwards in the, in the green room, the show, and he said, oh, man, Edwin and I were completely in somewhere else. And I said, I didn't, I didn't notice anything different. And he said, oh, yeah, you can feel it. So I guess that's what you're talking about, musicians like yourself. You kind of know uh, where they're going or uh, something. I could see it in their eyes. I mean, I can, I can, you know, great musicians don't have to look, turn their heads. They just have to express their facial expressions. And, and if, they're, if they're a tight band, everybody knows where to go. And that's, that's the difference between the big boys and the little boys, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. like, that, that band there, I mean, they are just, I mean, like, that, what they did the other day here, you know, they were just jamming. And, man, like, I think you were standing, I think I turned to you, I said, I just had an ear orgasm. Yeah. And, uh, it was phenomenal, and I wish I had a you know a, a real recording of that. It was that good. It was just yep. so so good. So you know, good. Every, uh, yeah. Thanks for bringing it's it up, great. Tommy. But everybody, if you go to uh, MadhouseTV.com or LegendsTV.net, you can watch the show that Tommy's talking about. Now, Tommy, you're you're known as the Woodstock Guru. Tell yes. me about that. What 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 the Woodstock Guru? What's that about? Well, um, I was at the 1969 Woodstock. Mm-hmm. And I was a 17-year-old kid that got thrown in the back of a truck and uh, actually kidnapped to go up there. But <laughs> that was I, a good kid. I, I actually, and so I was actually blessed to have witnessed that. Um, it, it changed my life. It, it on the spot. I, as I grow older, it even comes into me more. But uh, you know, I tell people don't be fooled by the name the Woodstock Guru. It's really not typically about Woodstock, although, you know, we do talk about Woodstock, but it's the, it's, it's bringing, it's, it's, it's a vehicle to try to bring kindness and caring and, and where, you know, you know, when people knew who their neighbors were and just, you know, smile when you see somebody on the street, you might change their day. And every day I put out a little thing, you know, it it was the spirit that I observed at Woodstock that I'm trying to capture with that page because you know, there's a lot of violence out there. There's a, unfortunately, we live in the land of me. Uh, let me stand still while the planets all revolve around me. And uh, if, if I could plant a little seed and, and maybe get a little garden going of good people. And, uh, you know, it's more like, I mean, I remember being at Woodstock and I was a kid. I was 17 years old. And, and you know, a guy would just take a sandwich and just take a bite and not even know the people and just hand it to the guy. Without even looking, just hand it down and hand it down and hand it down. Mm-hmm. Everybody cared. There was when you could put five hundred thousand people sitting shoulder to shoulder, touching. Everybody's t- touching, and not have one argument. Not one argument. You can't go to the drugstore without getting in an argument anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's a very evil world out there, and that's my vehicle. And you know, unfortunately, I'd like to see a lot more people jump on board and be a part of it. You know, people that do want to see the world change a little bit. There's so much gangs and violence and and drugs and, and drunk drugs, you know, it's just, everything yeah. is bad, you know, and I know there's good people out there, but we got to stop hiding and come out and, you know, show the world that there are good people and we're sick of it, you know, we want to have, you know, kindness and yeah. we're, I mean, when I was a kid, it was, you knew everybody on your block, everybody took care of everybody, it was a different world and, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, I have six grandsons and I'd like them to see a little bit of that world, but yeah. that's why I do it. So yeah, anybody you know, who, it's good sir. I can go on uh, Facebook and go on the Woodstock Guru and just hit like and you're in, you know? That's and this simple. is where they can read your daily musings, so to speak. Yep. The, yep. the every, Woodstock every, Guru on Facebook. Up. Huh? I was going to say the Woodstock Guru on Facebook is where yeah. they can find it. Yes. And you, yes. And you know, Tommy, you make a good point, too. I mean, this, this is going to sound like a rhetorical question. Well, first of all, a point I want to make is I really agree with you. I think there are more many more good people in the world than bad people, but the good people tend to just kind of hold back and stay good. Well, Steve, how many times have people say, see, because me, I'm not one to let things go. I mean, I'm a peaceful person, but I'm also not somebody to lay down and let somebody walk on me either. I will let somebody know if they're being disrespectful or something to me or anybody involved with me. Um, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, how many times have you been told let it go, let it go, let him go, let him go. You know what? Sometimes you got to stand up because there's too many people going, let it go. That's why we're in the shape we're in. We all let it go. Mm-hmm. It's been gone. We let it go, you know? Back in the day, and, you know, you're like around my age, 
I mean, you know, if there was a yep. problem in the neighborhood or something, you know, everybody was there in two seconds, and everybody yep. watched out for everybody now. You don't even know who lives next door to you anymore. Well, you know? that, it, is, it, that is so it, true. Yep. And now, people don't realize this is such a quick trip. It is such a quick trip. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, you blink your eye. I mean, I mean, I was just 40, and my kid is going to be 40. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yep. I mean, How did that like, happen, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when did that happen? Yeah. I mean, I go now. I, 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 you know, I played a lot. I played sports my whole life, and uh, I, um, I go down and watch my grandsons playing for the same high school team that I played for. And I go down and watch the games, and I go, I was just pitching on that mound. Now my, yep. not my kid, my grandson's pitching on that mound. It's bizarre, and people don't realize, you know, why, why make it so ugly? Why can't it be nice and and kind and People just get along. I just don't get it. I don't yeah. get it. I don't get the racial thing. I don't get anything. I mean, I know bad and good people of every color. It doesn't matter what color that you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter. Just be a good person. That's it. That's yeah. it. Be kind. You know, yeah. you, know? You, you know, Tommy, you mentioned, too, you know, how did this happen? Now your grandson is pitching. But you know what, Tommy? If we're getting older, that means we're still alive. So we have to be doing something right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's in the genes. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm a perfect angel. I've been I've been a good boy for 34 years, but I was, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was in the in the nightclub business when I was younger, and I, you know, I was one of them crazy guys too. But uh, I didn't like myself. I didn't. Really, I thought it was cool because everybody thought it was cool. But when I look back on it, it was really ugly. It really was yeah. ugly, and I I like where I'm at now. I'm like where I'm at mentally and uh, you know spiritually. I'm a very spiritual person, and. Um, and I think uh, when you are and you open yourself up to, um, you know, good people and, and surround yourself with good things, good things will happen. I, I believe that. Yeah. Tommy, tell us, tell us about um, your late friend, Roy Howard. Roy Howard, um, um, I, I, I can't, I mean, I, 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 I was so close with Roy. Roy, Roy bought uh, Yasger's farm from the Yasger family. And uh, Roy is just a hardworking guy, worked every day of his life. You know, he, he, he actually, you know, he, was, he actually accomplished and acquired a lot in his life, but people would have never known it because, I mean, the guy wore bibs every day, jeans. You know, he, he just, he wasn't a flashy guy, but the guy had a lot of money. No one really knew it, but he had a lot of money. But he bought Yaz's farm, and every year he would go to war with the town of Bethel, and they would slap him in his face every year, find him, stop him. And, uh, you know, the, bed, the more I got to know Roy, we actually, be, I mean, in the last 10 years, we became like brothers. I mean, I mean, really, 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 really spiritually close brothers. And, uh, you know, he tried to do uh, the reunions every year. And, like, you know, people say, uh, which, you know, by the way, I do have to say, I am not the Woodstock guru. I dedicated that page to Roy Howard because he has done more than anyone, and that goes for anyone that had anything to do with the 69 show, any of the producers, any of the musicians, anybody. He alone did more to keep the spirit of Woodstock alive than any person or probably any of them all combined. And that guy never asked for a dime, a nickel. He never made money. Everybody thinks he did, like, but he didn't. And... Uh, the saddest part was that I'd known Roy for a long time, and uh, this was the first year after fighting with these people, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in court, and he finally won where he got the permits to do it legally this year, and the man died in January. So he didn't even get to see it. Although I did, I headlined that show um, Saturday night up at Yasker's with the Amber Ferrari band, the Joplin's Pearl band, and I just was insistent on that I do, because whenever I was up there, Roy always asked me whether we were sitting on the deck or sitting in the front on the porch or riding in the car or in a place where there was music. He'd always ask me to sing House of the Rising Sun. And uh, <laughs> actually, at one of his memorials, I sang it, and his daughter came running over to my girlfriend and said, why did he pick that song? And she said, because your dad always wanted him to sing it. And she was hysterical crying, and she said, i got to tell you, she didn't know this. As he was dying, he pulled her face down and he said, sing to me, sing with me. And she's, well, you want to sing, Dad? And he goes, House of the Rising Sun. So I might lose it a little bit here, but uh, yep. I dedicated it to him. 
And that was the first song I did. Tommy, I saw that on YouTube. And uh, listeners, if, there won't be a dry eye if you, if you go to YouTube and watch Tommy Mars sing House of the Rising Sun. I mean, you, you lost it. I mean, God bless you for it. But you, you had a tough yeah. time getting through that song. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. Uh, and it was the first song out of the gate. But I'll tell you another thing that kind of threw me when I was doing that song, because we had met. Actually, they brought down Bar- uh, Bill Henley, who was the original sound man at the 69 Woodstock. Okay, and he came wow. down to down to Yaskers, and uh, he sat with us. We gave him some peaches, and he sat with us. And the weirdest thing in the world was when we went out to when we went up on stage to do our gig. Uh, who was working the sound? He only worked the sound for for us, for our band. And what an honor to have this man. I, I mean, I I couldn't believe it when I looked across to see him on the soundboard, and then they made an announcement that he was going to do the sound for our band, and the place went crazy. And I looked out, and the only thing that was bad was I couldn't hear a word I sang because I had no monitors. But how do you yell to this guy? You know, yeah. this sucks. You know? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we got through it. We got through it, and uh, it was very difficult. And I felt a little bit for Amber because I mean that girl is just a killer vocalist. She, I mean, for me, to even, I can't even be on the same stage with her. She is just a phenomenon. She's unbelievable. Anybody ever gets a chance to see Joplin's Pearl? Actually, they're playing uh, October 5th at the Pajak Theater. Don't miss it. It's a show that you will never forget. And uh, But going back to Yaz, because it was, it was a tough time. I went over and I touched, they, had, they put his two hats out in front of me on each speaker. And I, and I think if you saw the video, I said, I want to go over and touch his hat and dedicate this to my friend. Mm-hmm. And then when I walked over, and I actually seen this toothpick was still in his hat. And I went, oh, my God. And then wow. they said, the other hat over there. And I went over there and touched that hat. But I got through it, and um, and then we had some fun. And it was a, it was a great night. And um, it was a great week. And, you know, I played Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday. So I played in a lot of places up there. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It really, really, truly was. I had uh, uh, Elliot Lambie, uh, who was the photographer from uh, Woodstock, that is a world, still the, probably the most world-famous a uh, rock photographer in the world. Mm-hmm. He, we had dinner with him. And he took pictures of me and Janine, and I mean, he invited us to his home in Woodstock. I mean, it, it was just a crazy. And then we went to Richie Haven's um, funeral at the uh, at the Woods, and yeah, you, you know, know we, top, that, yeah. Was, that was, was a gonna, great, great. Memorial I was going to say we're up against the clock, so I want you to come back on because I didn't even get to Richie Haven's. And would you yeah, come back on in a couple? Thing. Could you come back yeah. on in a couple of weeks, Tommy, and talk I, to me about that? And I, you know, you're one of the good ones, Steve, I got to tell you. And, I'm, and all the listeners out there, I want to just say that, you know, you guys are in great hands because Steve is a real gentleman and a real pro. I will say that. And and everything, I see him work on Saturdays. He does everything professionally. And uh, I know he knows good music. That I know, too. And uh, so you're in good hands with my man, Steve, because uh, he's, the, he's the man. So Thanks, Tommy. The check is in the mail. Doing Tommy, anything, thank you. But, into his show because it's great. It's great. Thanks. Now, listen, uh, thank you. That's very kind of you, Tommy. Now, once again, where can uh, people watch your show? Tell them one more right, time. You go first. to uh, madhousetv.com and uh, you'll see we have lots of shows, so you'll see a lot of shows. Where, and just click on the Maverick, the Maverick Soul Hour with Tommy Mark. And that's on Monday nights. You can go in the archives also, and they're on YouTube also. You can go back and watch it 10 years after the show or Godfrey Townsend mm-hmm. or. or Jimi Hendrix, 70th birthday from B.B. King's. That's a great show. Everybody was there. It was crazy. And uh, and I do want to do, I, Steve, you don't mind, I want to give a shout-out to uh, sure. Vicki Bailey and uh, my my love of my life, uh, Janine Zerilli, who without those two, Madhouse wouldn't exist, that's for sure. And Tom Neely for giving me the shot, you know, to, to come on and, uh, and do my thing, you know, and... Um, and it's worked out great. Uh, it's a, it's a, you well, you you're a part of the family too, Steve. So you know how it goes, and uh, it's worked out very well. It's worked Tommy, out very well. But I'll I tell you, I you Tommy, them. yep, you Tommy, Tom, Janine, Vicky, you guys work so hard every every at least when they we're there Saturdays, and that's just when we're there. So you guys. I mean, you really put a, a solid work a day's work in, and we appreciate it so much for all the good for making us look so good on Legends TV. And you guys, uh, you, know, are the, you guys are the best. Yeah, well, you know, I tell you, for me, uh, I know how I am, like, when I go on stage, how I have, like, 
when you when you walk on stage, you want this and you want that. You hope that that's good. You hope that's good. So I try. I I I know what I like, so I know how important it is for these guys to to sound good and look right. And so I try to do my best with trying to 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 show that you know to the world. And and we are actually showing it to the world. So yeah, absolutely, it's been, it's been phenomenal. But um, right, you know, you're a big part of that show too, Steve. And uh, well. you know. Evan's a, a great guy. It's a it's a it's a delight. I actually love coming and and doing you guys' show. I mean, it's 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 a, that band is just phenomenal. I yeah, love well, them. I love. Well, them. You guys make it easy for us, Tommy. We appreciate it, and I appreciate you being on the show. You will come back, oh. though. I still have a lot more to talk to you about. Absolutely, any time for you, Steve. Any time, right. and uh, you know, and to everybody out there, you know, just uh, you know, a little kindness and a little consideration. Stop the road rage and. Uh, you know, maybe find out who your next door neighbor is and, uh, you know, get this place so that our grandkids and kids can have a decent place to live in. It's and a that's perfect about way all to, I got to say. Perfect way Peace to end and love to here. all of you. And, and I'm not one of those freaky hippies either. I'm not. Uh, I'm just a per- person that cares about uh, the future of this world. And uh, it's getting ugly. It's getting ugly. So, yeah, but we can, we can make it better. With, with more people like you, Tommy. People, people like you and doing your thing and, you know, our little seeds, we plant them enough, we'll get a garden going, you know? Yep. Sounds That's what good, they Tommy. say, we want to go back to the garden. Got to get ourselves back to the garden. <laughs> well said, Tommy. Thank you so much for being on. I'll see you Saturday. A pleasure, Steve. Can't wait to see you guys. Always always a pleasure. And God bless all your visitors and your viewers and your, your listeners of everybody and all your people that work with you that help you do your thing. God bless you all, and uh, have a great night. And it was uh, a joy to be on. Thanks. My pleasure, Tommy. Take care. And I guess that'll do it. Oh.